Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Buckeye fans? Welcome back to another episode of Locked On Buckeyes for the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the Jay Stevens Podcast. It is Tuesday, August 31st in the year 2021. And no matter if you're listening to the audio version of the podcast or if you're watching us on YouTube, I want to thank you for making Locked On Buckeyes a part of your day. On today's episode, we will be joined by Mr. Joey Kaufman. He is an Ohio State football beat writer for the Columbus Dispatch. Him and I have a fun time talking about season expectations and what we can expect to see or what he is expecting to see this Thursday against the Minnesota Golden Gophers. It's game week. Game preparation is completely underway. Have a phenomenal guest lined up for tomorrow to get the Minnesota Golden Gophers point of view as far as what their plan is on Thursday's game and how they will be playing, what we can expect to see from them during the season opener. Today is all about Ohio State. Today it is Mr. Joey Kaufman, and today I am excited on this game week. <clears throat> I know game week was yesterday. Well, first officially kicked it off here on the podcast yesterday, but man, as we inch closer to Ohio State playing the football, my excitement level keeps going up. I'm going to back away. Bring in Mr. Joey Kaufman as him and I do a fun, have a fun time, not do, have a fun time talking about season expectations for the Ohio State Buckeyes. And joining us now. Here on Locked on Buckeyes, it is Joey Kaufman. He is an Ohio State football beat writer for the Columbus Dispatch. Joey, how you doing? I'm doing all right, Jay. How are you? I'm doing very well, very well. It's time for football, and I'm excited. I'm, I'm sure you're excited as well that we're not talking about NIL. We're not talking about any of the other things that have gone on this offseason. We're talking about football games that will be played what is that thought? What does it mean that we're finally getting football to talk about? What does it mean to you? Well, I think we're all optimistic that this college football season is going to look and sound and taste like a – taste is weird. But it'll, it'll, it'll feel more like a normal Ohio State football season. You will go to a game at the Horseshoe, and the band will do Script Ohio before the game. They will play Carmen Ohio after the game. They will do a halftime show. You will have fans cheering if there's a touchdown or an interception. If the opposing team has a lull or if the opposing team makes a uh, a run at Ohio State, there'll be a lull in the crowd. So uh, last year just felt like something out of a, a sort of a horror movie when they were playing games where you – it just didn't feel normal. And um, I think that's been the, the word all summer and people are optimistic about some sort of return to normalcy and obviously – there's a Delta variant and things are spiking in Ohio, but the the Buckeyes have a high vaccine rate, vaccination rate. Other teams in the conference have a high vaccination rate. So despite all the stuff happening off the field, it does seem like we are going to have a something that looks and feels more more familiar. Absolutely. And I just can't wait to talk football, watch football, sit down and enjoy all the college football that we're going to enjoy week one, September 1st through the 6th, all of those games then throughout the season. I'm tired of talking about the other stuff. Now, the other stuff is important. Don't get me wrong. NIL is important. The transfer portal, that's there's importance there. The alliance, there's importance there. But just being able to see the Ohio State Buckeyes with all of this talent, Joey, on the field, playing teams like Oregon, playing teams like Penn State, like Indiana, like the team up north, there's something special about knowing the Buckeyes will be on the field very, very soon in front of 100,000 very loud fans. Yeah, in some ways, the season has, I think, snuck on, snuck up on us for, for all the things you mentioned. It's been such a busy summer in college sports and 
and usually June, July are, are pretty quiet times, but you had name, image, and likeness come into effect July 1st. You had conference realignment with Texas and Oklahoma, the alliance talk this week between the Pac-12, the Big Ten, and the ACC. And there's been all sorts of other sagas happening that it's you kind of wake up and realize, oh, there's going to be a, a normal-ish football season here starting in a – Few, few days and a 12 game regular season, hopefully for Ohio State and all the other teams in the Big Ten. Sure, hope so. What are some things you're looking forward to, like expectations for the season for the Buckeye football team? To me, I think for for Ohio State, I think the obvious intrigue is it is it quarterback with, with C.J. Stroud being named the starting quarterback, and I think a lot of people because he's an unknown, there are, are question marks and. He's never thrown a pass in college. And how many times have everybody in the Ohio State beat written that all summer? That's been, I think, every story I've had mentioned C.J. Stroud has not thrown a pass in college. But every quarterback Ryan Day has worked with at Ohio State has been really good. J.T. Barrett, he elevated his play in his final year. Dwayne Haskins was a first-time starter in 2018. He set records. Justin Fields was a first-time starter when he walked through the door in 2019. A little higher recruit than, than C.J. Stroud, but... Still, he had a, a smooth transition. So, to me, I'm curious if, if Ryan Day's magic touch with quarterbacks continues and if this offense kicks in the same gear as it, as it was before. I think that, to me, is is one of the more intriguing storylines. And on the other side of the ball, you have the defense. The, the, the pass defense, the secondary, was really exposed by Alabama last year. And can they make strides? Can Kerry Combs fix the defense? Because if – if the offense continues at its current trajectory and, and the defense can get fixed, I mean, Ohio State's going to have as good a chance as, as any team out there to win a national championship. They definitely will. And the quarterback position specifically has been one that's been watched by yourself, by others on the beat, like myself, uh, or I have been watching it. And other people have just been watching the quarterback situation, quarterback competition, trying to see who had the upper hand. And the more that I've heard, and I'm sure you've heard some of the same things from Players around the players on the team, they're saying CJ Stroud, his leadership was on front street and was visible from the very beginning when he got early on this season, or well, early on in the year, um, after the end of last season when, when Fields announced he was not going to be on the team anymore, he was going to go to the NFL. All the players started to say that Stroud's leadership kind of was exposed and kind of was once something that these players gravitated towards and the quarterback that they're looking to fall behind and be behind during the season. I think something to remember about C.J. Stroud is a lot of these wide receivers and, and some of these other players, especially in his 2020 class, they first met C.J. Stroud during the Elite 11 circuit. So you go back to the opening in 2019. C.J. Stroud was not committed to Ohio State at that time, did not have a scholarship offer from that time, but he impressed guys in his class enough that uh, they they ended up recruiting um, him to, in some ways to Ohio State. They they told the Ohio State coaching staff about about CJ. Ohio State then started scouting him a little more in person. Mike Yersich flew out to California on a bye week. So I think a lot of people, a lot of players in particular, go a few years back with CJ even before he came to to Ohio State. And I think that's something Julian Fleming, Jackson Smith, and the Jigba. They had some some firsthand experience uh, with CJ going back into the high school days. They did, and that's one thing that I think like you mentioned that there. The one thing to remember about him: these guys are comfortable with him. They're very comfortable with his leadership style. Uh, comfortable with his throwing motion. I've heard that he's throwing a as good of a ball, if not better ball, than some NFL quarterbacks. I I don't know. I'm not the uh, the analyst or the guy that can um, watch NFL, watch and watch college and say, well, he is doing that. I, that's not me. But if that's true, this offense, Joey, can be very, very scary. Not just with the wide receivers that everyone's talking about, but possible very beefed up offensive line and a lot of talent in the running running back room. He, he will be an interesting quarterback to watch, I think, because in some ways he really is different than Justin Fields. Justin Fields was somebody who could make plays with his legs to pick up a, a first down. He was somebody who could make plays with his legs to extend plays and, and move outside the pocket. We, we heard all, often about how he would um, maybe hold on to the ball too long. Well, the other side of the coin of that was, well, he was holding on to the ball too long because he was trying to, to make a big play. And 
really attack a defense. From everything people have said about C.J. Stroud is he's going to stay in the pocket more. And because they're so talented offensively between Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, all those running backs, Jeremy Ruckert at tight end, he can be, I think, a little more of a point guard than they've had uh, than they have with Justin Fields and and maybe dump off some shorter passes. So I think that's something with, with Stratt I'll be I'll be very curious to watch just how he plays the position versus how Fields play the position and and what they what they let Justin Fields do. Good point. Good addition there. What about the defense? We talk a lot about the offense, but what about the defense that Ohio State has that with a lot of new faces, new guys at linebacker, new base defense. A lot of changes there. Coombs is now just running the defense, not playing D coordinator and DB coach, double duty there. What are some thoughts or expectations you have for the defense at Ohio State? It's an interesting defense because they lose their entire linebacker corpse and they're going to break in an entire new starting group there. But what we don't know is, are they going to have three starters at linebacker or are they going to have two starters at linebacker and play more of a a 4-2-5 and, and have that fifth defensive back be more, be more of a bullet? So a lot there are a lot of personnel questions about how we'll see the, the defensive side of the ball line up. And I think that's the, one of the bigger questions for them going into the end of the year is, can they, can they fix some of those issues defensively? And I, and I think they're just going to need some players to to really play better than they played last year. They don't have a clear-cut lockdown corner, a number one shutdown guy like they had in 2019 where you had Jeff Okuda and Damon, Ar- Damon Arnett on the outside. Those guys were for two first-round draft picks. Jeff Okuda went as high as number three overall, and I think some people expect or anticipate maybe Seven Banks could have a, a big year. There have been some NFL mock drafts that have put him in the first round, which I think is largely a, a projection people expecting he's going to make a leap. So I think – for one, obviously, there's some some intrigue with the personnel and how they lined up. But two, I think we just want to see maybe how these players and, and some of these returning guys like Seven Banks, Josh Proctor, Cameron Brown, people who played last year in the secondary will benefit from having a, a full offseason year because guys like Josh Proctor have, have flashed at free safety. But how can they do it game in, game out, play in, play out, series, series out? So I think that's something to watch too. Are you expecting an improvement in the passing defense for the team? I think you almost have to. I mean, they were they were pretty low last year in, in pass defense down in the, the FBS. And granted, that was skewed a little bit because they played eight games and one of those happened to be against Alabama. Another one was against Clemson. So it's a little funky. But still, I think I do think they will be better. I think there's a good chance some of those guys I mentioned, like Seven Banks and Josh Proctor, make progress. I think they're also deeper, and I think they can rotate a little more. I think people like – Ryan Watts could have a, a bigger role. He's a bigger corner, I think about 6'3". So I think some of those guys who were, who came in last year were freshmen and didn't have much of a chance to get a spring practice or a fall camp could work in the rotation and and play. I think they're definitely going to be deeper. I think, I think that is something I probably would feel the most confident about. It seems like they have more options that they can rotate. They have more options for guys. If somebody's struggling, somebody gets hurt, they can they can plug in a guy. Because last year, I think even Cameron Brown was their slot corner. When he went down, you really felt his absence. There didn't seem to be anybody who was able to really get a handle on, on that role once he went down. I don't think that they would be as, as hard-pressed to find another body this year. Not just season expectations. We could talk about those all day long. You were part of the group of beat writers at Ohio State. I think there were 36 different individuals. I know one guy, Dave Holmes, works for the television. Uh, But there was – you guys had a fun job, fun time with your expectations. I'm going to run through these very quickly and then kind of discuss some of the things that you have predicted for the season. Predicted record record 12-0, predicting that Ohio State will not only – win the Big Ten Conference Championship, but also make the playoff. Your ranking for the playoff would be is number two. National Championship predict- prediction is Clemson. You predicted that C.J. Stroud will be the quarterback at the end of the season, as well as in 2022 as well. Leading rusher, Travion Henderson. Leading receiver, uh, Garrett Wilson. Number three receiver, uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba. I'm very curious about that one because we're on the same page. Just curious. I'm curious why you picked that one. Um, sack leader, Zach Harrison. Interception, Seven Banks. Freshman breakout, Jack Sawyer. And then pass defensive rank, 56. Let's go to the number three receiver um, position there. You picked the number third receiver on the team in receptions was going to be Jackson Smith and Jigba. With all the receivers and Jeremy Ruckard, why 
Jackson, Smith, and Jigba at that spot? Well, he's likely to end up as the starting slot receiver. I and mean, I think, for one, that means he's going to get a lot of touches and get a lot of looks because that's been a, a role in Ohio State's offense where they've targeted that spot a lot. I mean, K.J. Hill ended, ended up uh, leaving as Ohio State's, I think, career receptions leader, and he was in the slot. And and I think that that is designed to get somebody a lot of looks. And even though you have Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson on the outside, I think he's going to get a fair amount of attention uh, in that middle slice of the field. You know, I was I'm curious about this offense because you mentioned KJ Hill, and the offense is a little bit different versus what it was when he was in school. That doesn't mean that the slot receiver it can't be as effective and get as many catches as Hill did while he was at Ohio State. I'm just curious. I don't know. How with Wilson and Olave, with how good they are, I wonder how many catches those two guys will gobble up for the third person or Ruckert, who I hope is a bigger piece and bigger part of the offense. My own little wish there, who Ruckert could be number three because he can be very good in the passing game as well. I still think there will be enough if touches to go around because, yes, I, I don't think it would shock anybody to say I think Chris Olave and Gary Wilson will probably be one, two, and – receptions and receiving yards and all that. But, I mean, you go back to 2018, I mean, when Dwayne Haskins was throwing the ball around, they had a lot of guys who got volume. Paris yeah. Campbell, A.J. Yeah. Hill, Terry McLaurin, Johnny Dixon. They spread the ball around, even though Paris Campbell had over 1,000 receiving yards. So I think a similar situation could unfold this year where you have two clearly uh, dominant guys in uh, Olave and Wilson, and maybe they're around 1,000 receiving yards. But I think they're – there will be plenty of room for, for Jackson to, to make plays as well. And I think he's going to have a big role, obviously, because otherwise I don't know if Jamison Williams would have transferred after spring practice as he did. I think maybe that's a case of of somebody knows something that that we maybe didn't know back in, in April. But obviously he, uh, he saw what the depth chart might look like uh, this September. Absolutely. I'm going to go back up a little bit to the more of the top portion of this. You have Ohio State ranked number two in the playoff rankings at the end of the season. Clemson winning the national championship. Could you kind of explain both of those decisions for us? I think Clemson's defensive line is going to get better. They, they were they return a lot of guys at, at that spot. And I think if you look at Clemson, you look at Alabama, you look at Ohio State, they have three new starting quarterbacks. And, and those are the three teams that feel most equipped to win a national championship based on what they've done in recent history. And DJs won a game on the, on the road last year, or didn't win the game on the road, but uh, nearly had, had Clemson pull off uh, up to, at Notre Dame. So I guess that was part of my rationale. I'm, it's, that's what I lean toward. I think Clemson has the best chance to go through a regular season with the least wear and tear in their their bodies playing in the ACC versus the the SEC or the the Big Ten, and to me, I think whenever I pick Ohio State schedule, and sometimes you you think should I, should I pick them to go eleven and one or should I pick them to go twelve and zero? I look I look at each game, and I don't know where I would pick Ohio State to lose other than just eh, they'll have a slip up here or there. But I mean that hasn't really we haven't seen that under Ryan Day yet at all, so far in his tenure. You haven't seen a game where they just look totally ill-prepared, where they look like uh, they're going through the motions and there's a letdown. So so to me, I don't really forecast a spot on the schedule where they would lose. I did give thought to Oregon. That feels like a potential – if they're going to lose a game, that feels like it's it because C.J. Stroud will only have one starting uh, start under his belt. And I think Oregon's defensive line is going to test Ohio State. And Kevion Thibodeau, if – is going to pose problems because if Ohio State goes with that starting offensive line combination where Dewan Jones is a right tackle, I think that could be something Oregon looks to exploit. But they don't have a returning starter or quarterback, they, and, and I think that's going to be an issue for Oregon. I think if you're going to come beat Ohio State in Columbus, you're going to need a, a big-time quarterback to do it. The last team to do it was Oklahoma, led by Baker Mayfield back in, in 2017, last uh, time Ohio State lost in the horseshoe. So that, to me, I think is the issue. I think you're going to need a quarterback to come in and actually outplay Ohio State, and you look at the games that Day's lost in his tenure, Clemson in 2019 where they had Trevor Lawrence, last year Mac Jones against Alabama, and you look throughout Ohio State's schedule, I don't know where there's an elite quarterback they're going to face in the regular season. Is it maybe Michael Penix at Indiana, but I don't know. I think that's that's why I, I don't see them losing a regular season game. 
to the first game of the of the season, first game of the year in a couple of days. This is going to be coming out on Tuesday. On Thursday, Ohio State's playing the Minnesota Golden Gophers, going to Minneapolis and getting their season started off on Fox. Uh, I'm excited for the game, excited to get the season started. What are some things, a couple of things you're looking forward to seeing from the team on Thursday evening? I think I would just want to see how they use their, their personnel. I think there are still a lot of questions coming out of camp about who is maybe getting touches. I don't think there's a lot of question about whether Ohio State has answers at certain spots. I look at running back, for example. How do they distribute care? You have Maya Williams, who got a lot of reps and running back drills and was typically first in line in, in training camp. You have Master Teague, who's the incumbent starter. You have Trevion Henderson, who has high, high expectations. So not only who gets the first carry, but who do they really rely on in, in that game? I think a lot of questions about who the faces that we see, how often do they line up um, in, a, in a 4 2 5 versus their typical 4 3 front? How much do they rotate in the secondary? I think a lot of those questions are, are going to be the interesting ones. Just how do they start to use the personnel that they have? I, I think Ohio State's going to be okay against Minnesota, but how do they put the pieces together? I think is, is the intrigue for me. Do you have any concerns? The concern, I think, would be Minnesota's experience and, and just maybe the overall atmosphere. Ohio State hasn't played in a hostile environment since 2019 just because of, of last year not playing games and fans. That game will likely end up being a sellout. So that'll be a little bit of a challenge for, for them, I think. I think Minnesota's also experienced. They, they return a lot of starters. They have a lot of super seniors. I think maybe only Illinois among, among Big Ten teams has more super seniors because they brought back 20 guys, but at one point uh, the AP did a, a tally and Minnesota had 10 super seniors and they have a lot of returning experience, a lot of a returning starter at quarterback. So to me, that's not a game where Ohio State just goes and steamrolls somebody. I think Minnesota's too uh, competent all around to, uh, to just lay down, but but I still think Ohio State is more talented and over four quarters that should they should stretch away. Joey, this has been a lot of fun, a whole lot of fun talking football in the game that's going to be played in a couple of days from now. If you could let everybody know where they can catch you on Twitter and also where they can read your work as well. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Joey R. Kaufman, J-O-E-Y-R Kaufman, K-A-U-F-M-A-N. And then go to Dispatch Sports, dispatch.com slash sports, or go to BuckeyeExtra.com, which is the Dispatch's hub for all things related to Ohio State football, Ohio State basketball, and Olympic sports. Guys, the first game of the season is a couple days from now, and I'm glad we could get Joey Coffin on the podcast to talk about Ohio State and some expectations he has for the season. Joey, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for coming on Locked on Buckeyes. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Jay. And that's it for this Tuesday episode here of Locked On Buckeyes. Make sure you follow Joey on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter at jsteven07. The preparation for the season opener continues tomorrow and even on Thursday. Tomorrow, getting the Minnesota Golden Gophers point of view, like I mentioned previously. On Thursday, it's all about keys to victory and some final thoughts before going into the first game of the year. A little something, a little sneak peek into the future. Forgot to mention this at the top of the show. We will be trying to have live post-game shows on the YouTube. That is correct. If you're going, if you're already subscribed to the YouTube channel, great. If you're not, subscribe because we're planning to have live post-game shows after as many games as we can at the Conclusion of each game this year. Yes, I know some games will be night games, so the post-game show will be late. We're going to try to have some guests on there as well to try to spice up the anal analyzing, the instant analyst that you'll get during those post-game shows. So, so, so subscribe. I can't talk. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. I've mentioned it previously, so special things will be coming there exclusively for YouTube. This is one of them live post-game shows coming here for Locked on Buckeyes. Guys, it's Tuesday. Enjoy it. Tomorrow's Wednesday. First game's in a couple days. Let's have fun with our preparation and ramp up our excitement because the boys will be playing before we know it. And as always, we got to end the show with these two words. Can't end it now. Let's keep a good thing going. Go Bucks.